In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ is risen, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our weekly readings of the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Let us pray and proceed. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. <clears throat> Do forgive me for somewhat um, of a delayed start. We will fix the camera in just a second and uh, proceed with our reading, God willing. Today we are continuing to read Abba Sisoas. Uh, Abba Sisoas the Great was truly a great monastic, and uh, of course he offers us a tremendous boon. He offers a great, uh, how do I say, sort of a great consolation and, and uh, great amount of wisdom to be gleaned from his sayings. Chapter 15. <clears throat> Abba Adelphius, Bishop of Nicopolis, uh, Nilopolis, sorry, went to Abba to find Abba Sisoas on the mountain of Abba Antony. When they were ready to leave before setting out on their road, Abba Sisoas made them eat before morning. Now it was a fast day. As he was setting the table, behold, some brothers came and knocked on the door. He said to his disciples, Give them a little to eat, for they are tired. Abba Adelphius said to him, no, don't do that in case they say that Abba Sisos eats before morning. So the elder thought about it, and then he said to the brother, Go on, give them something. Now when they saw the food, they said, Have you visitors? And is that why the elder is eating with you? The brother replied, It was so. They uh, then were very distressed, and they said, May God forgive you, because you have let the elder eat uh, now. Do you not know that because of this he will mortify himself for a long time? Hearing this, the bishop did penance before the elder, saying, Forgive me, Abba, for I reasoned on a human level, while you do the work of God. Abba Siso is said to him, If God does not glorify a man, the glory of men is without value. Now, <clears throat> that is, in many ways, I think, quite self-explanatory, but let me just say for those who might not be acquainted with uh, sort of the monastic rule, why would it be considered wrong to eat in the morning? Because the monastics oftentimes ate uh, once or maybe twice a day at most, and they ate usually, especially on a fasting day, they would eat uh, sort of after the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. our time. And so since he ate before 3 p.m., because he had a visitor, um, the uh, other monks who came and, and visited at the same time uh, understood that he was doing that. He was sort of breaking his rule because of a visitor. And they told the visitor then and said, well, because of you, because he ate early with you, he will then punish himself. If I recall when we read about Abba Makarius, the great of Egypt, his disciple had to beg people not to bring him wine because if people would bring him wine and uh, during the meal he would drink for the sake of hospitality and to show his gratitude, he then would fast extremely strictly for several days uh, sort of to undo uh, the influence of wine. Not that he would be drunk, but just sort of considering it to be something of a luxury. And so in this particular case, Abba Adelphius was thinking that he should not eat so as not to be seen eating in the morning. While the brothers understood very well that the reason he was eating in the morning was because of a guest and uh, told the guest that afterward he would uh, sort of compensate for it, you might say, by much stricter fasting. Hence, uh, uh, Abba Adelphius or Bishop Adelphius saying, well, he reasoned like a man because he didn't want people to think ill of Abba Sisoas, but Abba Sisoas thought in a way that was truly of God because he did that which was appropriate for the sake of love and for the sake of love before sending his visitor on the way. Of course, he should have fed him, but he couldn't have fasted while his visitor ate, so he ate with him. 
regardless uh, of the fact that he would have to compensate quite strictly afterward. Chapter 16. Some brothers were uh, went to see Abba Siso as to hear a word from him, but he did not speak to them, saying, Excuse me. Seeing his little baskets, the visitors asked his disciple, Abraham, What do you do with these little baskets? He said, We sell them here and there. Hearing this, the elder said, uh, the elder said, Even Sisoas eats now and then. By these words, the visitors were greatly helped, and they returned with joy, edified by his humility. Now, <clears throat> um, <laughs> this is uh, uh, quite uh, cute, because in Russian, there's a slight difference of translation. And in Russian, it says... Uh, what are you doing with these baskets? The disciple says, well, we use them for this and that. And then the elder added, Sisoas eats sometimes from this one, sometimes from another one. And of course, you know, they were greatly edified and uh, and uh, sort of blessed by his humility. Now, whether they use the baskets uh, to sell them or... Um, to eat from them really doesn't matter in this particular case. I think what matters is uh, the very fact that Sisoas said, even Sisoas eats from time to time. Um, and that is uh, very important because sometimes, especially the beginners, when they seek advice, they look to someone who is well experienced and they think that this person is like uh, an angel in heaven, doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, you know, prays 24-7 and so on. And uh, of course, even the great saints had to sleep, they had to eat, uh, they had to rest. And uh, that sometimes is truly comforting and edifying for uh, those who are sort of at the beginning of their journey, because the enemy tempts them from the right by suggesting that uh, the way toward greatness, the way toward spiritual advancement is through uh, uh, how do I say, sort of extreme strictness, extreme fasting, extreme praying. And the trouble with uh, this sort of extreme uh, application of one's ascetic struggle is the fact that it is quite easy to break inwardly when you take uh, or undertake, uh, so to speak, an ascetic struggle, which is beyond your physical and spiritual strength, you fail. And this failure uh, sort of reinforces failure in your mind. When you fail, you give up, you sort of fall back. And when you start again, uh, you are more prone to fail the next time because, well, obviously you just failed before. And for that reason, sober-minded approach to orthodox, pious, and spiritual life would dictate that we uh, take upon ourselves a struggle, a struggle which means uh, there is need, as we read in the Fathers, to do violence to ourselves. In other words, to make an effort, yes. To uh, sort of force ourselves, yes but force ourselves within a reachable limit to do violence to ourselves within a reachable limit, to pray enough to be able to concentrate on prayer, to focus on prayer, but not to get too tired of prayer, to fast enough to learn to acquire the knowledge of subduing our flesh, of controlling our impulses, but not fast to such an extent that we suffer and sustain physical damage to our bodies because, uh, you know, there are people who sort of rush into spiritual life and take way too much to begin with. They fail. Then when they try again and take too much a second time, they fail again. And imagine if somebody fails at something three times, he will altogether have a tendency to abandon uh, his endeavor. And so for that reason, this was the consolation for the young monastics that Abba Sisoas said, even Sisoas eats from time to time. So, you know, uh, he's also made of human uh, flesh. Pious, yes. 
Uh, an ascetic, yes. A struggler, yes. But within reason. Because the fathers do say, virtue without discernment is also a sin. So in all of our spiritual efforts, we must practice discernment and make sure that we do not undertake that which is beyond our strength because we will suffer damage. Chapter 17. Abba Amun of Rethu asked Abba Sisois, When I read the scriptures, my mind is wholly concentrated on the words so that I have something to say uh, if I'm asked. The elder said to him, That is not necessary. It is better to enrich yourself through purity of spirit and to be without anxiety and then uh, and then to speak. Uh, so, let's see. This is interesting because, once again, and, and do forgive me for sort of uh, looking off to the side to the Russian translation. Maybe I can put it more sort of uh, toward the center so it won't be seen as a distraction. So, uh, in the Russian translation, there's a slightly different meaning. When I read the scripture, a thought... Uh, comes to me to take care for a philosophical word, for sort of learning, uh, preparing for uh, debate, for dialogue, uh, and learning uh, some wisdom, you know, gleaming some wisdom from the scripture. And uh, Elder Sisso, as the great says, there is no use in that. It is better in purity of mind to seek for yourself uh, sort of the simplicity of word without the artificial uh, beauty. And indeed, uh, what is it? Um, sometimes people say simplicity or, or brevity, right, is the sister of wit or the sister of talent. And uh, for that matter, indeed, if we think somehow that we must convince others uh, by the complexity of our uh, sort of dialectical skill, well, then, of course, we miss uh, that which is the most important because if we have purity of spirit, purity of heart, purity of mind, then completely unprepared, not at all. He's simply saying, search for the purity of soul and the simplicity uh, with which you speak. Now, could this lead to pride? Uh, is that why he suggested it? Potentially, yes, because if someone thinks that, well, it's also uh, possible that this would lead to uh, self-reliance rather than reliance on God. Because if we think somehow that we can convince someone or we can edify someone based on our rhetorical skill, which nonetheless we should acquire by all means, uh, we should not be negligent uh, of this because sometimes our opponents are definitely well prepared and they do that. But this should be secondary to the simplicity and purity of mind and because sometimes all rhetorical um, structures fail uh, in argument, in debate with the simple truth. If someone speaks the truth in love and in simplicity, there's no arguing with it. Uh, you can, <laughs> and uh, you can sort of have all the various constructs, but sometimes, uh, you know, the men of God would speak very briefly. They would say, you know, just a short phrase, a couple of words, and with that statement, they would shatter all the arguments of the philosophers. Now, uh, there's a perfect example in the life of St. Anthony the Great when the Greek philosophers presumably Christians and believers in God, came uh, sort of to test him, to, you know, to mock him because they knew that he was illiterate. And they thought, well, you know, what can this illiterate man teach us? You know, we know philosophy. We know uh, the great writers of old and of the Christian times and so on. And, and he, he's just a, a peasant, you know. So when they came to him, St. Anthony perceived their thoughts. He saw the intent for their coming. And he said to them, before you speak, may I ask you a question? And they said, well, of course, Abba, go ahead. He said, what was first, letters or thoughts? And they said, well, of course, thoughts, not letters. He said, well, then the man of understanding has no need of letters. Or the man who has acquired understanding. 
possibly, uh, he said, who has acquired discernment or wisdom, has no need of letters. They were greatly edified. They understood that he perceived their thoughts and he responded to the very reason for their showing up. They bowed to him to the ground and said, truly, he is great and left greatly edified. Now, we're not all called to be like St. Anthony the Great. Uh, some of us are well literate. We are reading a book and using words, words of the Holy Fathers and the sayings of the Holy Fathers to obtain spiritual benefit. However, to rely solely on our uh, debate skills, on our rhetorical skills, of course, would be dangerous indeed. It would lead to pride. And in some cases, it could also lead us away from the truth because rhetoric, for the sake of rhetoric, uh, well, just sort of fails uh, in its mission. And in the same way, you would say that the Holy Fathers say that the goal of prayer is the union with God. So prayer, for the sake of prayer, would be a sin as well, or at least it would be sort of a, a poor use of our time and resources, spiritual and, and, and uh, material as well, if uh, our prayer sort of entails, uh, you know, the lighting of lamps and candles and reading of books and so on. Our prayer should lead us to God, to the union with God. If we're united with God, then the words of prayer become secondary. You know, sort of uh, the primary is standing before God with a contrite heart. And in this particular case, indeed, uh, it is better in the purity of mind to pursue uh, the simplicity of word. Well, all of the Holy Fathers actually make an undeniable point that God is simple. He is not complex. He's not compound. God is singular. And triune in his unity and his singularity. In that way, you might say that simplicity is kin to God because God is simple. He's pure. He's holy. He's uh, all good. And anyway... <clears throat> I don't mean to talk too much myself. Let's read on. Chapter 18. A secular, or a layman, who had a son came to see Abba Sisoas on Abba Anthony's mountain. On the way it happened that his son died. Ah, this is a beautiful story. Uh, it's really, really, really encouraging, inspiring, and comforting. Uh, I always remember the story without thinking of the name and considering that it was Abba Siso is the great, it would make perfect sense. So here it is. So on the way it happened that his son died. He was not troubled by this, but brought him with confidence that the uh, to the elder and bowed down with his son, as though making prostration, so that he would be blessed by the elder. Then the father stood up, left the child at the elder's feet, and went outside. The elder, thinking that the boy was bowing, said to him, Get up and go outside. For he did not know that he was dead. Immediately the boy stood up and went out. When he saw it, his father was filled with amazement and went back inside. He bowed before the elder and told him the whole story. When he heard it, the elder was filled with regret. Imagine this, he just raised the dead and he was filled with regret. <clears throat> For he had not intended that to happen. So the disciple asked the father uh, of the child, not to speak of it to anyone before the elder's death. Now, this is uh, uh, an astounding and beautiful story. And it goes to show the true humility that the saints possessed when they uh, practiced the ascetic life. If the father brought his son uh, as dead to the elder, he would never raise him from the dead. He would never seek this glory and fame for himself. And, of course, the reason the disciple uh, sort of uh, swears the father not to tell anyone is because if he did tell someone about this before the elder's death, well, the line to see the elder, you know, with the sick, the dead, the possessed, would be way, 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 way down the road. And the elder would no longer be able to be who he was. He would no longer be praying to God and standing before God with his heart uh, pure and, and, and contrite, but he would be sort of forced to perform these miracles to 
respond to these needs. There are two very similar stories that reflect quite beautifully on the humility of the saints. One is my favorite. Uh, the family with a possessed, demon-possessed son comes to an elder and the elder says, no, 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 that's not to me, that's to the elder so-and-so, go to him. Uh, they go to that elder and that elder says, no, 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 go to the first one, uh, the one that you came from. It, he will he will do it, not me. And so the family, like a ping pong, they went, you know, many times from family to family. And finally, exasperated, they fell at the feet of one of the two elders and said, you know, we've been to both of you so many times and neither one of you would help us. Please have mercy on us and help us. And so the elder at whose feet they fell, he said, okay, okay, by the prayers of the other elder, get out. And the demon left their son. So he took no credit for the driving away of the demon. Now, in a very similar way, and in a way more similar, so to speak, to uh, the story that we just read now, there was another demon-possessed young man who was brought to the monastery uh, to be exercised, to, you know, to, to be healed. And the monks, the brothers of the monastery, told the family straight out, if you tell the elder, if you tell the saint uh, that you have come for the exorcism, he would not do it because he would not want the credit of an exorcist, you know, and a, a miracle worker, a wonder worker. And so the family said, well, then what do we do? How, how do we, you know, sort of, uh, how do we get our boy healed? How do we get rid of the demon that is possessing our son? And so the monks uh, presented them with a clever scheme similar to what this father of a dead boy did. They basically said, you know, uh, the elder has his own place in the church. Put your son in his place. And when the elder comes, he'll tell your son to get up and leave. And hopefully the demon will leave when he says that. So they put the possessed boy in the elders, uh, probably it would be something like a Greek word, stasidia, uh, which is uh, a chair that you could stand in and you could sit in. It has uh, armrests up and armrests down below. And the seat there folds in such a way that, you know, when you need to stand up during the service, you can fold it up and you can lean on the uh, upper armrests while you're standing because of the lengthy services. And so the young monk, uh, the young the young monks told the family to put their son in this chair in the seat of the elder. The elder arrived at church for the service, looked at him and said, get out. You know, free my space, get out, walk away. And of course, the demon left in the same way that this boy rose from the dead when Abba Siso said, get up and then go to your father. Now, you might say, well, how is it that neither uh, Elder Siso is in this particular case, nor the monk in the, in the last case I mentioned, really had an idea that they were raising the dead and, and, and casting out the demon? Why did it take place? Well, God wanted to glorify them and to show to all that they were his true servants. So he made uh, death and uh, demon obey them even when they were not aware of what they were saying. Uh, they were glorified by God because they did not seek their own glory. And of course... Uh, if you see somebody who is seeking his own glory, well, that would be the number one uh, testimony, you know, that this person is not a true uh, servant of Christ, is not on a proper path of the ascetic struggle. Uh, the only time you see when someone is the true servant of God is when uh, this servant attributes uh, the working of miracles not to himself, not to his asceticism, not to his own achievement, but to God. We know also that St. Anthony the Great healed the sick by simply laying his hand on them. But each time when he laid his hand upon the sick person, he would say, It is not I, Anthony, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who heals you. Uh, go in peace. And the person would be healed. So in this particular case, we see Abba Sisos works such a great miracle as well. Uh, and you might say, sort of, in a way, r related to the uh, <clears throat> to the previous uh, little conversation that he had with Abba Amun of Rethu, he says, you know, seek uh, simplicity and the purity of heart. Well, in simplicity and purity of heart, he said, 
little boy, you know, boy, get up and go out to your father. And of course, the boy rose from the dead. So we could see that in particular case, uh, immediately following story proves uh, the benefit of simplicity. He didn't make any speeches. He didn't address the boy in any way. He just said, get up and go. And the boy rose from the dead. Chapter 19. Three elders came to see Abba Siso as having heard about him. The first said to him, Father, how shall I save myself from the river of fire? He did not answer him. The second said to him, Father, how can I be saved from the gnashing of teeth and from the worm which dieth not? The third said, Father, what shall I do for the remembrance of the outer darkness is killing me? By way of reply, the elder said to them, For my part, I do not keep in mind the remembrance of any of these things, for God is compassionate, and I hope that he will show me his mercy. Hearing this, the elder went back offended, but the, uh, but the elder, not wishing to let them go away hurt, said to them, Blessed are ye, my brothers, truly I envy you. The first speaks of the river of fire, the second of hell, and the third of darkness. Now if your spirit is filled with such remembrances, it is impossible for you to sin. What shall I do then, I who am hard of heart, and to whom it has not been granted so much as to know whether there is punishment for men? No doubt it is because of this that I am sinning all the time. They prostrated themselves before him and said, Now we have seen exactly that which we have heard of, uh, which we have heard tell. So, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, another reflection of the beauty of true humility. Uh, you might say that when these three elders spoke of uh, their way of remembering death, you know, one talking of the river of fire, the other one talking about the uh, the, the gnashing of teeth and the, uh, and the worm that ceaseth not, and uh, the third one talking of the outer darkness, they were stating that they had made a tremendous ascetic undertaking. You know, they are constantly focused on death, you know. Uh, and Elder Siso says, well, I don't think I just, you know, only hope in the mercy of God. Uh, and then uh, when they were offended, he says, well, I envied you because while you're thinking of death, you cannot sin, but I sin all the time, you know. And uh, their response is, we have uh, seen that which we heard about you. In truth, you might say that he did not give them any particular uh, wise instruction. They might have wanted to hear something. And oftentimes, think about it, when we ourselves find someone who is sort of reported uh, to have a certain spiritual experience, a certain spiritual maturity and discernment, we approach such an individual uh, very often asking for advice that would sort of correspond to what um, the Abba said, who said that he was trying to sort of learn uh, wise words from the scriptures as he read them. In the same way, when we ask for spiritual direction, we want uh, some lofty, and, and wise uh, counsel that would be sort of appropriate and applicable to us. Yet true men of God very often respond in ways which are so simple that uh, might actually be a turnoff for us. Uh, when we approach a priest uh, sometimes and ask him for counsel, and we expect to hear something very sort of rhetorically sophisticated, you know, very uh, elaborate. And he simply says, well, you know, hope in the mercy of God or pray to God, save yourself. And we think, well, you know, what kind of advice is this? What do I do with this? You know, however, these three elders who were engaged in a specific practice saw that St. Sisoas uh, superseded them in his simplicity because he did not even consider himself to be the one engaged in the memory of death. 
he considered himself to be sinning all the time and hoping in the mercy of God. And in that way, he was continually thinking of God, but he wasn't doing it in such a way as sort of to look back at himself and think, oh, I'm always thinking of hell, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sinning. I'm actually good. Uh, I'm, I'm behaving. He was simply saying, well, you know, I sin all the time. and I only hope in the mercy of God, which is sort of the degree of spiritual advancement greater than theirs. Now, the tremendous mistake on our part and uh, sort of the proof of our lack of experience and in some ways you might say even sort of spiritual foolishness would be to say that, ah, perfect, we could do the same. We should just say, well, we trust in the mercy of God and we would go on with our lives messed up as they are. Uh, you know, sort of persisting in conflicts with other people, uh, bearing offenses, judging and committing multiple sins. You see, the great difference here between us and Abba Siso is, is that most likely Abba Siso is, uh, didn't have to think of these things, of the uh, river of fire, of the gnashing of teeth and the worm that ceaseth not, and of the outer darkness, because he was thinking of God himself continually. He would have had God in his heart and in his mind all the time. And so he was able to say, I trust in the mercy of God and humble himself. Uh, essentially saying that he is not practicing the virtues of these three elders who came to visit him. Because he surpassed them. We haven't even come close. Uh, it would benefit us tremendously to think of death more frequently, to think of the outer darkness, to think of the gnashing of teeth, to think of uh, the river of fire and the worm that ceaseth not. However, uh, despite the fact that uh, our current response, well, we just hope in the mercy of God, because more or less, that's all that we're capable of doing. That's all that we can offer to God. Well, that does in no way uh, compare us to Abba Siso as the great. Uh, he, he is at the perfection level of that statement. We are perhaps at the very beginning. And these three elders are past the middle stage. They're, they're closer to perfection, thinking of death as uh, the way to prevent sinning uh, and to keep themselves pure. Uh, and Elder Siso is, who sounds like one of us, He's reached the pinnacle of perfection in this particular case. And that is why they say to him, that which we heard of you, that is exactly what we see. Chapter 20. They asked Abba Sisoes, uh, perhaps these three same elders, if a brother sins, surely he must do penance for a year. He replied, that is a hard saying. The visitor said, for six months. He replied, that is a great deal. They said, for 40 days. He said, that is a great deal too. They said to him, what then? If a brother falls... And the agape is about to be offered. Should he simply come to the agape too? The elder said to them, No, he needs to do penance for a few days. But I trust in God that if, a, if such a man does penance with his whole heart, God will receive him even in three days. Now, <clears throat> the matter of penance is of great importance because it is probably uh, the part of our spiritual life that sees the most abuse and reading the statement of Abba Siso is we should be extremely careful so as not to use it as a license to sin uh, because well he says then you know in three days God will accept us the problem with this is the fact that if the brother does repent properly and he does some penance, God can receive him in three days. Is there proof of Abba Sisola's words? I dare say there is. Uh, the perfect proof is the life of St. Mary of Egypt. St. Mary of Egypt engaged in horrendous harlotry and uh, adultery and fornication. Uh, she was engaged in all manner of terrible sins. But when she repented, venerated the cross, we are told that she received Holy Communion before crossing uh, 
uh, the Jordan and going into the desert. Think of it this way. What does her life teach us? She swore to the mother of God. She sort of made a promise, you might say gave an oath, um, that she would never, ever go back to the life of sin which she practiced before her arrival at the temple, uh, you know, of, I'm assuming the Church of the Resurrection in Jerusalem, where the Lord's tomb is and where the cross was erected for the veneration of the faithful. She was given communion, then she went into the desert. And in the desert, we know that she struggled tremendously and suffered greatly for 17 years before acquiring peace. So in this particular case, you might say that she received communion and then proceeded to do penance uh, for 17 years with str struggle plus 30 more, you know, another sort of 47 years total until her next communion. Now, can God forgive someone's sins in three days? Absolutely. Is he capable? Absolutely. Should that be applied to us when we sin and we behave in the way that is most callous and uh, lax and uh, absent-minded? I dare say no. The reason is because if we commit a sin, and let's say we arrive at church and maybe even quote this particular saying to the priest who hears our confession and say, Father, you have to give me communion. You know, I have repented. Well, so if the priest gives us communion, but we have not repented in earnest. And what does it mean to repent? To repent means to stop that particular sin from happening again. In that sense, you might say that when it comes to laziness, uh, inattention and prayer, judging others, uh, being absent-minded, uh, we are not fully repented yet. We are struggling. We are trying to repent of these sins in an ongoing fashion, yet they do not preclude us from re uh, receiving Holy Communion. But if a brother falls, you know, sort of, if someone commits uh, a sin unto death, uh, fornication, adultery, murder, or something, you know, very, very, very grievous, well then, uh, there's more required in repentance. And if we were to say, well, three days is enough, I've repented, give me Holy Communion, Imagine a person who has cheated on his wife and is given communion after three days. Uh, how do you think he will resist another temptation to cheat on his wife? Will he really struggle with it? I don't think so. Because uh, that which we receive freely, we do not value. So if the person has had no reason to do significant penance, and I'm not talking 10 years uh, or anything like that, but if there's no proper penance, if there was no proper repentance, the person will return to sin. And then in that way, allowing the person to receive Holy Communion so quickly and to be reinstated so quickly without proper healing would actually be uh, destructive to the person's soul because the very mystery of the Holy Communion is desecrated for that particular individual. And this particular individual would be receiving communion to his condemnation. For that reason, both the person who is sinned who is confessing and the priest who is hearing his confession must take care, must take heed to ensure that proper repentance is achieved. Not penance in terms of punishment. It's not the matter of time. It is not something that the priest should say, well, you know, if you do a penance, penance for a year, then you're okay. The person can abstain from cheating in his wife for a year uh, outwardly, but inwardly is the person faithful, is the person, or, you know, the wife cheating on her husband, I'm sorry, and uh, just using that as an example, or any other scenario. Yes, we can do the time of uh, repentance and not truly repent inwardly. So this particular inner repentance is uh, of tremendous significance. In some cases, yes, uh, if it is evident that the person has repented and has learned the lesson uh, and the wound has been uh, uh, treated and uh, healing is administered, then yes, the person can be uh, granted communion way more uh, speedily than the canons stipulate. However, 
we must have a tremendous amount of discernment and I would say fear of God that healing has taken place, that repentance has taken place. Because if we just turn to this particular saying and use this as a license uh, to sin and to remit sins, well, we will undo the very fabric of the church. And uh, indeed, if we engaged in sins heavy and grievous licentiously, uh, then truly we will lose our love and people will fall away from the faith and from the church because they will say, well, what kind of a Christian is he? He's doing all this horrible stuff and he's going to communion like nothing happened. Uh, you know, it's a temptation for the person. It's the temptation for the people surrounding him. So for that matter, we must be very careful. In the same way, I would say that uh, Elder Siso is the great said, well, I... I really hope in the mercy of God, and even though I, I sin every day, I hope in the mercy of God and the elders say, truly you are great. Well, it is in that spirit that he says, yes, if a brother truly repents, even three days is sufficient. Uh, but that's just it. Repents, repents, repents. And very often, and alas, sometimes I, I happen to see this as a priest, people come and they don't repent. They have no intention of, uh, you know, uh, ending the sin that they're engaged in and yet they're still hoping to receive holy communion uh, quoting things like this or or showing us these examples and saying well but god is merciful he forgives why won't you forgive well it's not a matter of the priest not forgiving it's a matter of the priest having the care that the person is properly healed before healing is pronounced upon him because we also know that uh, the prophet said woe unto you if you call evil good and good evil. And in this particular case, Abba Sissos is calling good good and evil evil. And he says, if a brother has repented, even three days is sufficient and he needs to do penance. Uh, but we're talking repentance in the spirit of his life. Uh, and that uh, definitely is important. And of course, yes, indeed, uh, many thanks to uh, Elizabeth who writes, that the thief uh, on the Lord's right comes to mind. He simply said, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom and was granted paradise. So not even three days was sufficient for him to inherit paradise because he repented. And his repentance uh, of the thief on the cross, of course, is manifested in his words. We have received the just punishment for our sins. We have murdered and robbed and, and, and pillaged and we are crucified. Uh, for fault but he is uh, faultless the lord is sinless he's suffering this unjustly and then he says lord remember me and if thou comest in thy kingdom so indeed if we offer unto god a heart that is broken and uh, contrite he will forgive us um, however allow me to say something else uh, in this regard before we uh, finish for the night. Uh, <clears throat> when we hear this, you know, is three days going to be sufficient? And Abba Siso says, yes, three days will be, you know, even three days will be sufficient. Let's go back to Prophet uh, and the King and the Prophet and the Psalmist David and Prophet Nathan. We know from the Holy Scriptures that uh, when King David uh, had committed sin with uh, Bathsheba, with the wife of Uriah. And when he learned that uh, she was pregnant, he recalled Uriah back from uh, the war, thinking somehow that if Uriah spent the wife, uh, the night with his wife, then uh, essentially, you know, he could sort of keep King David's child as his own. But Uriah uh, was pious to a fault, you might say. He spent no time with Bathsheba when he was uh, home from the war. He slept outside his house. And when the servants of King David reported that to him, he sent Uriah to his death because he realized, well, there was no hiding this pregnancy, this child. It would come out and, uh, you know, there would be a conflict with Uriah. So he preempted the conflict by simply, uh, in fact, the tragedy of it all that, you know, Uriah had to take his death sentence in his own hand and deliver it to Joab, to the general of King David, uh, the letter which said, the sealed letter which said, take Uriah into the hot spot and then kind of fall back and let the enemies cut him down. Uh, 
death sentence indeed. What happens to King David afterward when Prophet Nathan comes and, and very skillfully, and in this particular case, uh, skillfully in a rhetoric way, he doesn't simply say from the, uh, from the threshold, you are a murderer and an adulterer. He actually offers a parable. Uh, the king pronounces judgment on himself and only then, uh, with tremendous rhetorical skill, uh, Prophet Nathan says, it is you, you are the man who killed the one, uh, you know, who had only one sheep and you had 99. And so King David offers penance. We have the beautiful Psalm 50, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy, as a consequence of this particular repentance. Is he reinstated with God? Yes. Is he forgiven? Yes. However, stop and think of his further life and the pronouncement uh, which was spoken by God by the mouth of prophet Nathan to the house of King David. Prophet Nathan returned and said, the sword will not depart from thy house from now on because of what you have done. And later on, uh, we have the tremendous tragedy of Amnon raping, um, uh, let's see, Tamar, Absalom's sister, Absalom, seeking vengeance and killing uh, Amnon, uh, who was the firstborn son of King David. Then Absalom, not stopping at that, but also turning against his father and starting a civil war uh, in, in Jerusalem. David persecuted, flees. Then Absalom is killed. Uh, these are the consequences of the sin of King David. Has God forgiven him? Yes. Have the consequences still come upon him? Also, yes. And so let that be a sobering reminder to us that when we think somehow, ah, oh, it's okay, you know, I can cheat, I can lie, I can steal, I can commit adultery, uh, you know, sort of betray my, my spouse, I can do all these things. <sighs> you know, maybe your priest is super merciful and he won't even give you a penance. Just read the prayer of absolution and allow you to go to Holy Communion. And for all intents and purposes, it would look on the outside that you have no consequences to your sin. Alas, look at the example of King David. Tremble and realize that the consequences may still come upon you. Uh, will you be forgiven? Yes. Will you attain the kingdom of heaven? Yes. Will you have to atone? Yes, you will. And uh, I will add to that the words of uh, Father John Christiankin, Ioan Christiankin. He was, uh, I think, the confessor to, uh, let's see, Metropolitan Tichon of Pskov, the one who wrote, uh, you know, the, uh, what is it, uh, Everyday Saints, you know, the book about the people who are not glorified in the Church of Saints, but who in his mind, you know, are equal uh, to the saints by, by manner of their lives. Now, Elder John, who was greatly respected in Russia, uh, has left a number of letters behind. And in one of his letters, he writes, I can't remember if he writes to a layperson or he writes to a priest, but he says something very sobering. He says, the priests in our day and age are failing to heal the, the flock. They are not giving any penances at all. Uh, they're very lax. They let anything go. Uh, and he says, alas, that forces the Lord's hand and he is left to give penances to people on his own. And then Elder John says, and what are the Lord's penances? They are illnesses, they are sorrows, they are privations and various troubles and tribulations that are sent to people to purify them and cleanse them of their sins or because of their sins. Thus, if you are confessing to a priest and the priest never takes care to uh, sort of administer healing to you, you know, if you are given uh, no uh, sort of requirement whatsoever to atone for your sins, if they're grievous enough, of course, obviously, you know, we don't give penances for judging other people and so on, uh, you know, and, and the various sort of sins that we commit on a regular basis and we confess on a regular basis. But if we've committed grievous sins and the priest has done nothing at all, 
to offer us spiritual healing. The healing will come from the Lord, uh, and you can rest assured that it will come at the time that the Lord judges to be expedient. And however uh, terrifying or scary it may seem, it will be for your salvation. So in that sense, while I say uh, take heed, do not sin licentiously, do not give yourself a pass and say, ah, it's no big deal. I'll go to confession and then go to communion and life will go on. No, life will not go on. If you do something seriously bad and the priest does not treat your wound, the Lord will treat it. He will treat it for sure. And he will treat it in the way that is best assess accessible and known to him and him alone. In that particular case, uh, your priest will have to answer for being negligent to God himself. But God will treat you. The only thing is, when you are treated by God, when you are visited by God with sorrow, with tribulation, with illness, uh, and, you know, with whatever uh, sort of the visitation that God deems appropriate to heal your sin, do not be discouraged. Do not despair. Give thanks to God for his love, for his healing, because this trial, this tribulation would be a healing. It would be therapeutic for your soul and for your salvation. And of course, do not lose hope, but pray to God. And as Elder Sisoas the Great said, hope in his mercy and he will heal you and forgive you, even as he has forgiven the thief on the cross. And he forgives all of us on a daily basis. So with that in mind, a uh, quick housekeeping moment. Next Wednesday, I do believe next Wednesday uh, will be the leave taking of Pascha. And if that's the case, let me just uh, search the schedule very quickly. I believe that we will not be able to do uh, our prayer service and reading in the evening because there will be, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, actually, no, I am mistaken. Next Wednesday should be absolutely fine. Uh, there is nothing happening next week. So it's the Wednesday after. So in this particular case, God willing, next Wednesday, uh, the 25th of May, we will do the prayer service and the reading as is our custom. Please pray for me and uh, God willing, we'll see you next week. Let us sing a short prayer and uh, we'll say goodbye for tonight. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.